he was working as a janitor. But when the police went to interview him, he had already left. Next is Mount Nyangani. Mount Nyangani is the highest mountain in Zimbabwe and the location of several mysterious disappearances. They claim you should not enter the sacred areas on the mountain, otherwise you will become lost and unable to leave. In 1981, two young teenage daughters of a finance minister vanished without a trace on the mountain. A massive air and ground search could not find any evidence of the girls. Five years later, an eight-year-old boy, Robert Akhurst, also disappeared after wandering away from the group on a school trip. More recently, in 2014, a 31-year-old man, Zaid Dada, was hiking in the mountain with his wife and another couple. Halfway up, the others gave up while Zaid continued on alone. He was never seen again. An extensive search was launched involving the Zimbabwe National Army, the Air Force and the police, as well as numerous mountain climbers, professional trackers and volunteers who swept the landscape using advanced technology, 3D satellite maps, and infrared scanners. Every possible route up the mountain was thoroughly searched to no avail. The family even distributed hundreds of posters in several languages across the region. Some say that these disappearances are caused by the fast changing weather on the mountain, where it can quickly get extremely foggy. This makes it easy to get lost, or slip and fall. In 2020, there was a case of eight-year-old twin brothers who accompanied their father and cousin on the mountain as they were trying to retrieve their missing cattle. The group lost their way and ended up having to stay on the mountain in the night in heavy rain. In the morning, villagers went to search for them and found all four unconscious. After being rushed to hospital, both twins later died. Those that went missing may have had similar fates, but since no bodies were ever found, their cases remain unsolved. Those who have been found alive say that they could hardly remember anything during that period they went missing and are almost in a trance-like state. One senior government official said he once got lost for four days when he was a young man. He was with two companions and the group later claimed that they had wandered aimlessly in a confused state. When eventually found, they felt as if they had been missing for just a few hours. They were not hungry and did not show any signs of fatigue or dehydration. During the four days they were missing, search operations were unable to find any trace of them. However, the group said that they had seen searchers looking for them but they themselves seemed to be invisible and were not seen or heard when they called out to the rescue team. A former resident said, I lived for two years in Nyanga and at the time three small children disappeared. It is a beautiful place but also scary, especially when the weather suddenly changed. I did walk a short distance up the mountain, but returned as there is a kind of power or supernatural force. I was alone, and I suddenly felt uncomfortable. The total number of people who have disappeared on the mountain is unknown. Next is Agatha Christie. In 1926, English author 
set to one side, either dead or too tired to continue. Colonel Bochamp continued to advance through the woods towards the Turkish main positions, leading 16 officers, 250 men, including the Sandringhams. The colonel was spotted standing with another officer in a farm on the far side of the woods. He shouted, We've got the village, let's hold it. That was the last anyone saw or heard of Colonel Bochamp or any of his men. They had all suddenly disappeared in broad daylight. One New Zealand soldier later claimed he saw them march into a cloud, which then rose up into the sky, leaving no trace of the men. His testimony was supported by three other veterans. The war ended in 1918, and the battlefield was searched. During one of the searches, a Norfolk regiment badge was found buried in the sand, along with the corpses of 180 soldiers. It was reported that every one of these bodies had been shot in the head. Captain Beck's watch was later bought from a Turkish officer and given to one of his daughters. It was known that the Turks did not like taking prisoners. One theory was that the British had been outnumbered and were all executed on the spot. Although we can assume the men were killed, what happened exactly is unknown. Next is Solomon Northup. Solomon Northup was an American abolitionist and author born in 1807, New York. He was the son of a freed slave and a free woman of color. At age 34, he met two men, saying they worked for a traveling circus. Solomon was a professional violinist, and they offered him a job as a musician for some shows in New York City. Thinking the job would be brief, he did not inform his wife, Anne. The men then persuaded Solomon to continue on their tour to Washington, D.C., where slavery was legal. When they arrived, he was drugged, kidnapped, and sold as a slave. Solomon served under several owners, some of which treated him very cruelly. In one incident, his owner was about to hang him for fighting back. However, a previous owner intervened and saved his life. In 1852, Solomon confided his past to a Canadian carpenter, Samuel Bass, who had expressed his abolitionist views. Samuel wrote several letters to Solomon's friend providing details of his location in the hopes of his rescue. New York state law provided help to free New York citizens who had been kidnapped and sold into slavery. His family took the case to the New York governor and Solomon regained his freedom in 1853 at the age of 46. That same year, Solomon wrote and published his memoir, Twelve Years a Slave, which became a bestseller. Nobody was punished for his kidnap and enslavement. Solomon gave over 25 lectures and speeches to build momentum against slavery, but then disappeared from historical record four years later. The last mention of him occurred in 1857, when a Canadian newspaper reported that he was forced to evacuate a scheduled lecture in Ontario when a hostile crowd prevented him from speaking. He was no longer listed as living with family, although his wife Anne was still recorded as married. There was speculation by family and friends that he was enslaved again, but historians say it's unlikely as he would have been considered too old at the age of 50 to bring a good price. In 1875, records identified Anne as a widow. What happened to Solomon between the 
was not accounted for in the U.S. Census of 1860. Some evidence indicates he may have joined the Underground Railroad and spent several years in New England helping escaped slaves to reach Canada. One letter later reported him to be alive in 1863, and historians estimate that he died that same year at the age of 56. Next is Ambrose Pierce. Ambrose Pierce was a prolific American writer, poet, and Civil War veteran. His work has been ranked alongside Edgar Allan Poe and Voltaire, while his war stories inspired Ernest Hemingway. In 1913, Ambrose told reporters that he was traveling to Mexico to gain first-hand experience of the Mexican Revolution. He disappeared and was never seen again. In October that year, then aged 71, Ambrose departed from Washington, D.C. for a tour of his old Civil War battlefields. According to some reports, by December he had passed through Louisiana and Texas, crossing by way of El Paso into Mexico. In Ciudad Juarez, he joined Pancho Villa's Revolution Army as an observer, where he witnessed the Battle of Tierra Blanca. It was reported that Ambrose accompanied them as far as the city of Chihuahua. His last known communication was a letter he wrote to Blanche Partington, a close friend, dated December 26. 1913. He ended the letter by saying, As to me, I leave here tomorrow for an unknown destination. Then vanished without a trace, his disappearance becoming one of the most famous in American literary history. One writer concluded that Ambrose deliberately concealed his true location, then went the Grand Canyon to commit suicide. Some of Villa's men were questioned at the time of his disappearance and afterwards with contradictory accounts. Pancho Villa's representative said Ambrose was last seen in the city of Chihuahua in January 1914. A witness claimed that Villa admitted and he ordered Ambrose to be shot, after Ambrose said he was leaving to join up with another sectarian leader. On the other hand, an American soldier named Tex O'Reilly believed that Ambrose was killed by Mexican federal fighters while drinking at a cantina in Sierra Nevada. If this is true, and Ambrose died before ever meeting with Pancho Villa. The theory is backed up by rumors in the city of Sierra Nevada. The oral testimonies were documented by a priest, which he said were by trustworthy witnesses, stating that Ambrose was executed by a firing squad in the town cemetery on suspicion of being a spy. Although if this is true, it doesn't explain why Pancho Villa and his men would lie about meeting with Ambrose. There are others who also reported Ambrose's death in several different locations of Mexico. Then there are some who say that Ambrose did not die in Mexico at all, that he traveled south into Latin America as he once said he would. Ambrose wrote in one of his final letters, Goodbye, if you hear of my being stood up against a Mexican stone wall and shot to rags, please know that I think it is a pretty good way to depart this life. It beats old age, disease, or falling down the cellar stairs. To be a gringo 
in Mexico. Oh, that is euthanasia. Next is Virginia Dare and the Roanoke Colony. Virginia Dare was born in August 1587 and was the first English child born in a New World English colony named Roanoke Colony, today known as North Carolina. It's not known what became of Virginia and the other members of the colony. The knowledge of her birth is known because Virginia's grandfather, John White, who was also the governor of the colony, returned to England in 1587. But when he eventually returned to America three years later, the colonists were all gone. Little is known about her parents. Her mother, Eleanor, was born in London around 1563 and was the daughter of the governor, John White. Eleanor married Ananias Dare, a London bricklayer. They were part of Sir Walter Raleigh's expedition to explore and settle land in North America on behalf of the English Crown. Virginia Dare was one of two babies born to the colonists in 1587 and the only female child known to have been born. Virginia's grandfather, John White, sailed back to England for fresh supplies at the end of 1587 after establishing his colony. England's war with Spain caused a need for ships, so he was unable to return to Roanoke until August 1590, where he found that the settlement had long been deserted. The buildings had collapsed and the houses were taken down. John was unable to find any trace of his daughter or granddaughter or any of the 80 men, 17 women, and 11 children. He did not see any signs of a struggle or violence. The word Croatoan was carved into a post of the fort, and the letters C-R-O carved into a nearby tree. All the houses and forts had been dismantled, suggesting that their departure had not been rushed. Before he had left the colony, John instructed them that if anything happened, they should carve a Maltese cross on a nearby tree to indicate their disappearance had been forced. There was no cross, so John took this to mean that they had moved to Croatoan Island now known as Hatteras Island. However, he was unable to conduct a search at that time. One theory was they sought shelter with local Indian tribes and either intermarried with the natives or were killed. One report indicated that the survivors had taken refuge with friendly Chesapeake Indians the chief of another tribe claimed they had attacked the group and killed most of the colonists. He showed certain artifacts that he said belonged to the colonists, including a musket barrel and a brass mortar and pestle. However, no archaeological evidence exists to support his claim. Thirty-five years later, in 1612, there were reportedly two-story houses with the stone walls and the Indian settlements of Bekarachanik and Ochanoa. The Indians supposedly learned how to build them from the Roanoke settlers. There were also reported sightings of European captives and various Indian settlements during the same period. One account wrote that four English men, two boys, and one
one woman had been sighted at the Eno settlement of Rittenock under the protection of the chief. They were being forced to beat copper. The theory was that they had escaped the attack on the other colonists and fled up the Jayanoke River, today known as the Chowan River. Tutankhamun's tomb indicated there could be another compartment at her 
has not yet been opened. Some believe that the TT might be in this hidden chamber. Next is the Nanking Battalion. The Battle of Nanking, also known as Nanjing, was fought in December 1937. The Chinese and Japanese armies were fighting the control of Nanking, the capital of the Republic of China. Many lives were lost on both sides, but the strangest loss was that of the Nanking Battalion. This battalion of almost 3,000 Chinese soldiers simply vanished, and there is still no agreement on what exactly happened to them. They had been assigned to a two-mile circumference around Nanking, forming a defensive line near a bridge on the Yangtze River. The Japanese had taken control of the city, and the Chinese soldiers were ordered to prevent them from leaving. On the evening of December 9th, the commander Li Fu Xian went to bed as normal after seeing his troops, ensuring that soldiers had been put on the night watch. In the morning, he was told that the defensive line was not responding to any signals or calls. A team was sent to investigate, but when they arrived at the defense position, they found it completely abandoned with no sign of struggle. The heavy weapons were still in place, and the fires that had been lit were still glowing and warm. The first theory was that they had surrendered to the Japanese. However, this is unlikely, since they would need to cross the bridge to Nanking. Soldiers stationed on the bridge said they had not seen any movement across it. Other soldiers said there had been no sounds of combat during the night. They did not have any leads on what happened to the defensive line. Defecting or surrendering would be unlikely due to the horrific treatment the prisoners of war received from the Japanese. They would have been tortured or outright killed. Information later provided by the Japanese does not mention any surrendering soldiers in Nanking. One theory is that the soldiers deserted their positions. This is possible as the troops might have been tired of fighting or felt hopeless in their situation. Instead of going into Nanking by the bridge, they may have left in another direction. However, the vegetation in the area was sparse and would not have provided enough cover for 3,000 soldiers. Japanese reports state that they never encountered a group of Chinese soldiers. This many soldiers would be very hard to hide, and if they deserted, some of them 